Hey guys, it's Eric here. Hi guys, Luke here. And we're back with another episode of the Political Incorrectors podcast. Um, it's been a jam-packed few days. The last time Luke and I recorded uh, was a couple of days ago. I think it was last week. Uh, we had a lot, a lot of, to talk about it in that in that episode. And since then, I'd say, despite the fact that the adult term is currently in recess, it's been a busy uh, couple of days, couple of weeks in Irish politics. Uh, in today's episode, we have a lot to discuss. Uh, but the first item that we're going to get into is recent controversy that arose, uh, a storm that has hit the RS, um, uh, particularly Sabina Higgins, the wife of our president, uh, Michael D. Higgins. Uh, Sabina Higgins wrote a letter in response to an editorial in the Irish Times uh, about the war in Ukraine. And in her letter, she essentially made a, an anti-war plea or a poetic cry, I think it's better to put it in that way, uh, for the war to come to an end. We caused a lot of controversy because a lot of people thought the manner in which she spoke about the war, uh, bringing about peace uh, between uh, both parties in the war, uh, was problematic. The terminology she used, some argue, treated Ukraine uh, as if it was a state that was on equal moral footing to Russia. Uh, and on the other side of the argument, people thought that there was hyperbole in those that were criticizing Sabina Higgins. And many people took an anti-war perspective to essentially validate and justify Sabina's statements. Uh, and they claimed that what she was arguing was essentially in the best interest of everybody. So it has been uh, a storm, uh, to say the least. And Twitter has been active. Uh, politicals across the country have been vocal. And politicians have been very vocal about this issue also. And there's been a political divide, I think, slightly um, between the parties in the Dáil uh, in, in, in terms of reactions to Sabina's letter. So I, I guess, what do you think of the, the, the fallout uh, after the publication of the letter? Yeah, well, I think this is like a season. So when the Dáil is kind of finished for the summer, I think people call this city season where, you know, stories like this come out of nowhere. Uh, or come out of the Irish Times opinion pages and uh, turn into these big scandals. Um, but this is this is certainly a big one, uh, and I suppose a big kind of constitutional one because it involves the the office of the president, um, which is a big deal. Uh, and obviously, throughout Irish history, there's been some drama with the president, and uh, uh, it always leads to sort of. I mean, I guess it's entertainment, but it, it's quite serious too. Um, but I guess you know when I first saw this come out, I mean, uh, to be honest, I wasn't surprised. I think. Um, both Michael D and Sabina Higgins have been very vocal uh, for years on numerous issues. So when I saw that Sabina had written a letter in in the Irish Times to the editor, I, I wasn't entirely surprised. And to be honest, I wasn't in any way really annoyed about it because I, I just kind of saw on Twitter that, OK, Sabina Higgins wrote an anti-war letter to the editor of the Irish Times. OK, not surprising. Um, and it, to be honest, I didn't read it when I first saw it. Uh, but then the kind of the real backlash started, I think, when the Russian ambassador to Ireland, um, Filatov, who's a, um, an interesting character to say the least, who lies on national television, um, he praised the letter uh, and kind of said that it's a, it's a good to see, uh, you know, Ms. Higgins called for negotiated peace between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And that to me was a big red flag uh, because um, if the Russian ambassador is praising it, it's probably not a good thing. Um, and so I read the letter and to be honest, Eric, I was, I was really surprised at the kind of, the patronizing tone of it and the kind of condescension that comes through. Uh, and I think it, it's a letter that's really easy to be written by an occupant of Oris Nukaran in Phoenix Park in Dublin, um, who doesn't kind of get a real glimpse into the realities of war on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, and obviously, Ukrainian people are fighting to defend their country that was illegally invaded by an imperial force uh, that is Russia. Um, people who had normal jobs picked up arms to fight for their home place. And Sabina says to them, and at the end of her letter, uh, she has um, a poem uh, or an, a peace anthem, as she refers to it here, written uh, in during the First World War. And it's called Turn Back, O Man, and Quit Thy Foolish Ways. Um, I think that's a good message to say to the Russian forces. But in her letter, she, she more or less places uh, Ukraine and Russia on the same pedestal and I'd just love to know if let's say Savina was to go to Ukraine would she say to someone who um, their family has left uh, and is currently you know in another country while that person is fighting against an, occup uh, an occupying force would she say to that person to turn back and quit their foolish ways uh, because they're defending their own country I, I don't think so um, and yeah I think I was quite baffled by it. 
the tone of the letter. I'm not sure about you. Yeah, I only actually recently read the letter. Um, um, so when I first was discussing um, this letter with you, Luke, I, I was, because I was looking at the reactions to the letter and that's how I made an estimation as to what the content of the letter looked like. I tried very hard. I was on the Irish Times app, tapping away, trying to find the letter, but because it was a letter, I couldn't actually find it as easily as, say, an article. So I was looking at a lot of the reactions to the letter and I saw a piece of the Times where Sabina... Sabina's comments uh, trying to clarify what she said or shared. So I was going by that. I was also going by public commentary. And initially I felt as if the letter was perfectly uh, reasonable, even if I disagree with the stance she took, because it was nothing new. Uh, I think in arguments, globally speaking, with regards to the war. So there are many uh, prominent intellectuals. So there's two kind of ways you can approach it, favoring Sabina's argument. One is like a geopolitical realism about the fact that the war is serving no one, that many people are dying, that as Sabina said in her letter, there are people in the global south who are suffering because of shortages, 10 million people uh, are at risk of hunger uh, at the moment because of the war, uh, there's the cost of living crisis, there are issues pertaining to oil uh, for the, the entirety of Europe, um, and there are figures like Yanis Varouf Varoufakis, who was a, a, a seminal figure of the Uni uh, European Union, um, and other like left-wing intellectuals like Noam Chomsky, who have essentially argued that uh, an approach that appreciated the real political of the situation, which saw concessions being made, made, not necessarily because Russia is favored, not because Russia is appreciated in a moral perspective, but just to bring about a resolution and a reasonable peace for everybody involved, that that might be the course that Europe has to run and Ukraine has to run, unfortunately. Uh, and then, of course, there's the anti-war perspective, which is nothing new. Vietnam, uh, the world wars, we've seen anti-war campaigners time and again throughout the 20th century and before that. So I thought that she was simply speaking to one of the two traditions, which I thought was perfectly okay. Uh, and then the reactions really, I think, amplified my position. It made me more obstinate with regards to my perspective, a perspective that didn't necessarily agree with Sabina's position, but didn't see it as something that was nearly as outrageous as people were making out making it out to be. I saw politicians, uh, I can't remember the name of this specific politician, um, John McGahan, I believe his name is. Yes, uh, there was a photo of him with a phone in his hand, uh, talking about how he was just off a uh, call with the media, uh, talking about, on, on the media, Sabina's letter. And it was like a sort of JFK-ish photo. <laughs> there was lots of optics with it as if, you know, this was a stance against tyranny. <laughs> uh, and this was the same with a lot of politicians. I think there was a lot of political opportunism that was coming to the fore because of the letter. And a lot of people, I think, use it to prove their pan-European credentials and, you know, how um, they stand with Ukraine and stand with the oppressed. A lot of posturing, which I personally never like to see in politics. I think it's quite off-putting. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, I think Eileen Flynn, um, who is a senator, a uh, senator who does fantastic work, uh, who I definitely really appreciate, but she took the wholly ideological anti-war uh, approach in a tweet she put out, essentially saying that she doesn't understand something like this, I'm paraphrasing roughly, why people dislike Sabina's letter when it's an anti-war letter. Well, that's, I think, a too simplistic interpretation of Sabina's letter. Uh, so I think both ends of the spectrum took it a bit extreme. Something that I, I really wanted to discuss also and this came to mind when I was looking at the reactions, was the political divide. So the left really favored Sabina's letter, understandably. Um, I didn't see any response from Sinn Féin, per se, interestingly. Uh, <laughs> maybe they're playing it smart, but the more radical leftist party. So uh, I saw Paul Murphy putting out tons of tweets. Uh, and then the centre-right in Ireland. So Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, uh, I didn't see much from the Green Party, because the Green Party are traditionally an anti-war party. So they probably decided to stay out um, it's like the philosophy. They disliked uh, the letter. And I was wondering whether the active Oros, the really vocal Oros that we've seen, as you alluded to, with Michael D and Sabina making tons of statements, particularly Michael D, has left a bad taste in the mouth of the government parties. Uh, and that might have inspired uh, a dislike for the letter, or at least uh, the step that they've taken to condemn the letter publicly. So this was all circulating in my mind until, it still is, but less so when I read the letter and saw it for myself and saw the poem 
and saw one pa paragraph in particular that I think is worthy of being addressed, where um, Sabina says, until the world persuades pre President Vladimir Putin of Russia and President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine to agree to a ceasefire in negotiations, the long haul of terrible war will go on. How can there be any winner? So from that paragraph, she's talking about persuading both sides. And that's essentially placing both sides on equal footing. And I didn't think she was doing that before I left, read the letter. And I don't think that should be done because persuading Putin is a radically different task to the, <laughs> persuading Zelensky to bring about peace. She then goes on to cite the civil war that was fought in Ireland, the war of independence that was fought, fought in Ireland, and the 1916 rising, and how the latter two uh, were ended as a result of a settlement. But in the latter two situations, you had Irish rebels fighting for Irish freedom. Um, you know, this was a colonizer versus the colonized, the free versus the oppressor. Um, and in the situation with Ukraine and Russia, it's similar. So you can't speak with both parties as if they're on, on an equal footing. And I think this is what she did. And I think it was the anti-war ideological flowery framework and goggles that ushered her into doing this. And I think it's actually anti-realism, not pro-geopolitical realism. And I don't think that's the perspective that needs to be taken to bring about peace in the first place. Yeah, that'd be my perspective. Yeah, for sure. And I think like on the face of it, you know, if you speak to the average person and they see that Sabina has written a, a letter calling for peace, um, it's very hard to disagree with that, you know, to disagree with a call for peace um, and an end to the war. And I think on the face, as you've said, like there's, there's nothing overly controversial about the statement. Uh, but when you dig into it, I think there, that kind of, a kind of unrealistic ideological attitude um, and a kind of patronizing, I think, uh, outlook on the situation shines through. And just in, I just kind of dig, dug into the an initial uh, Irish Times editorial that she wrote into the editor about. And in that editorial, they, the editors of the Irish Times called for Western governments to undermine their commitment to support Ukraine for the long haul. Um, so that was the initial editorial. And in response, Sabina, Sabina sent this letter. Um, so essentially, I think the Irish Times obviously came to the conclusion that, look, this, this war isn't going to end soon. Peace isn't going to come soon. And so Western governments need to commit to support uh, Ukraine in the long haul in what will probably be um, a more prolonged conflict, which I think is a realistic uh, uh, outlook on the situation. Um, and in response, the Irish Times have since responded to Sabina's, uh, to, to Sabina's letter uh, again, uh, I think just yesterday. And they said that this newspaper has consistently held that Russia as the aggressor should cease its campaign and that Ukraine should be supported in opposing it. So I, I don't think there's anything controversial about that either. And obviously that's in line with the approach of, I think, our government. I mean, we're trying to support um, the Ukraine as much as possible, obviously not militarily because we're a militarily neutral country, but we're trying to provide as much support as possible to the country. And obviously other countries in the EU are providing military support. Um, so I don't think there's anything controversial about that. Um, and so looking at the situation, I think if there's someone who's in the wrong, I think it's certainly Sabina Higgins. Uh, but I think... What's interesting, there's, there's more to this situation that's interesting than just Sabina led, Sabina's letter. And it's obviously the situation of her being, as you said, um, a member of this Aorus. And, you know, First Lady isn't of an official position in Ireland. So it's interesting, you know, there's people saying that, you know, Sabina has the right to free speech because she's just a regular citizen. Um, but is she just a regular citizen? Because, OK, she's not officially the First Lady of Ireland because it's not a position. Um, but she is the spouse of Michael D. Higgins. She's an active participant in his presidency by his side, you know, goes to events with him. Uh, often, I think I think she speaks at events. I think she's opened um, official openings. And at what point are those lines blurred? And obviously a big part of the story, and I think caused a lot of controversy, the politicians, like you said, John McGahan, Fine Gael senator, and I think Aaron Rugreen is another Fianna Fáil senator who was very vocally opposed to it. One of the things they were very angry about was the fact that this letter was not just put into the Irish Times, but Sabina had it posted on the official president.ie website. So the official uh, website of the Irish president, Sabina's letter appeared there. And so there was this really weird situation where obviously the president of Ireland isn't supposed to have any kind of policy role. Uh, that role is with the elected government you know, uh, of the day, so the current coalition. Um, and here we have two conflicting views. And I think that was pointed out by kind of more international figures. Uh, I think it was in Politico 
EU, they pointed out that there was this like the the first lady or the wife of the president has a different view to the Irish government. Um, I think that caused a lot of problems uh, with government. Uh, t- it was really only senators, to be fair. I think the the most vocal were I think Malcolm Byrne, Fianna Fáil, was quite vocal on it too. John McGahan, Aaron McGregan. Uh, Michael Martin seemed to want to move away from it. I think he kind of said maybe yesterday as well. It's time to move on. Uh, I think he just doesn't want to get into a constitutional crisis when he's supposed to be taking some downtime in August. Um, but yeah, it it brings up some very interesting questions about the role of the presidency, particularly about the role of the spouse. Um, and we did see, of course, uh, Arthur Mahoney, uh, good friend, called for the resignation of Michael D. Higgins over the whole thing. Um, so it was a potential constitutional crisis. I think it's kind of gone by the wayside now. But it does bring up those interesting questions about the role of the presidency and did ultimately Sabina and Michael D and the office of the president overstep uh, in this situation. I think they probably did, to be fair. Yeah, really interesting um, because when Bunuk Naharan was actually was written, it, was, it wasn't was written at a time where there was a RS website in the first place. So what does it mean in a ju- digitized world for the president or the spouse of the president to take a particular stance on the website constitutionally? Uh, how would that be interpreted in court? Uh, the president, of course, has some discretion, so he is allowed to make particular comments on issues of the day. There are particular things where he needs government approval, like uh, issuing a statement to the Shannon and the door, but coming out and saying things about social issues like a couple of months ago when he made comments about housing, which I know rubbed a lot of people in the government the wrong, wrong way. Uh, he would be allowed to do things like that, but something as vital and consequential, consequential as the war in Ukraine, that's tied to the country's foreign policy, or it could be, an argument could be made. Uh, and therefore, you know, things that lead to political, uh, continental media outlets uh, touching on a clash or a contrast between the government's approach and the approach of the Oros, or at least the wife of the president, what does that say uh, with respect to constitutionality? I certainly believe that um, uh, symbolically, it being put on the Oros was detrimental uh, to the state's image internationally. Uh, it simply didn't look good, particularly because Ireland has been hailed by Zelensky and many people who support Ukraine for the position Ireland has taken when it comes to this war. And Ireland has been seen, is seen internationally um, as um, the much quoted speech from Kennedy, J.F. Kennedy, um, half a century ago on the Dáil, uh, alludes to the fact that Ireland might be neutral, but is always on the side of peace and liberalism and is a forward thinking nation. Um, so if this is the reputation of Ireland and a letter uh, clashes with that reputation, not necessarily, but at least issues a challenge to it in the eyes of some, and that challenge is recognized internationally. What does that say for, for the country? Um, I think calls for resignation are a bit <laughs> extreme and hyperbolic. I think it was a very impassioned subject. Uh, I saw many of our tweets and many people within uh, the government parties, the youth wings as well, and people generally speaking, uh, naturally, you know, because of the nature of the situation, because of how huge this war against, rather, this invasion of Ukraine is, naturally, I think a lot of people, particularly people who are great sympathizers of the European project, you know, would strongly dislike Sabina's letter. But I think mens rea matters, you know, her intention matters. At, at best, I think the Ukrainian MP who criticized the letter was the most correct when it comes to detractors, when she said that it was misguided. Uh, I don't think her intention was bad. She's essentially calling for peace because of people who are impoverished, um, who suffer because of a lack of food, because of the cost of living, because of the people dying on both sides, essentially. And I think the anti-war perspective, I don't know if you've ever seen the famous Charlie Chaplin speech, um, (laughs) where he talks about like foot soldiers being used (laughs) in war. Uh, I think the anti-war, that's the backbone nearly, that speech, you know, where he talks about, you know, little men being used by the big monsters behind the scenes to fight wars that they'll never dip their toes in. That's probably an accurate description of Putin. Uh, and that's the backbone of the anti-war perspective. However, Zelensky, you know, he's defending a state. He's defending sovereignty. He's fighting for independence. And I think Ireland, one thing that I've always argued is that Ireland has to be on the side of fairness because our alma mater is fairness and equality and fighting for freedom. It's what Ireland is internationally recognized for. And in this case, you know, we know what it's like to be the colonized state. We know what it's like to fight against a colonizer. I think the highest figures in the state have a soft obligation to live up to the Irish standard of being on the side of the oppressed. 
And I don't think this letter did enough to address who the oppressor was and who the oppressed is, um, which is where I think she went wrong with the letter and publishing it on Oris, despite her freedom of speech, which is perfectly fine. I think it's a valid argument. If I was having a discussion about the war uh, with different parties, I'd have the like anti-war radical at the table. I might not put into practice their suggestions, <laughs> but I want to hear different perspectives. But publishing it on the RS's website, I think symbolically is just not right. Um, so yes, this is my ultimate conclusion when it comes to the issue. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree. I think the, the letter, look, at the end of the day was just really misguided. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned the Ukrainian MP, I think Kyra Ruddick, I think is her name, probably terribly pronounced, but she's been very vocal and she's actually been on Irish media a lot. Um, but one thing she said about the situation, about Sabina's letter, uh, one thing she said was, if, if it does one thing, it kind of points out that there's a cohort of people who think that you can easily negotiate with Vladimir Putin. And I think that's obviously uh, not easy, uh, you know, geopolitics the last 20 years can probably point that direction that he's not someone you can just easily negotiate with and um, but the other thing she said about the situation about the kind of idea of a negotiated peace and this is part i hope i get this right but she more or less said that um if russia stopped fighting now the war ends but if ukraine stopped fighting now there's no more ukraine uh, because ukraine are fighting uh, for their very existence because i think russia have been quite clear that they want to take over the country. And obviously they use the Russian speaking regions as their justification to enter. But I mean, that hasn't stopped them push forward to Kiev and push through the, the whole country. And even just a couple of days ago, uh, Medvedev, who was the, he was president when um, president of Russia, when uh, Putin had to step down constitutionally, um, was kind of a more, a more moderate figure when he was president. But since then he's kind of gone down the Putin line of things. Uh, and he posted on Russian social media a couple of days ago and uh, about Ukraine, but said that more or less the intention of Russia should be to do this to other little Russias, um, like Kazakhstan um, was one example. So there's this kind of uh, imperial mindset that's at play in Russia and Russian government um, that needs to be protected against. And it's not as simple as saying, let's just have peace negotiations and end there. Uh, I think you kind of risk the Chamberlain moment again, not to be, you know, not to push to that too easily, but there's kind of like Czechoslovakia during World War II. Um, there's lots of people who called for negotiated peace with Hitler and, you know, that didn't turn out well. And I think, you know, Putin and the Russian government have been quite clear about their uh, imperial goals throughout this conflict. So I, I do think ultimately uh, Sabina's letter is probably slightly misguided. Um, and I think we both kind of come to that conclusion. A lot of people have. Um, and it's also raised a lot of good questions about the presidency, the role of the presidency. And I do wonder if, you know, as we said, Sabina and Michael D have been very vocal throughout the presidency, um, whether it's Michael D praising Fidel Castro when he died as a as a great hero uh, that caused a lot of problems. The housing situation a few uh, weeks ago. Um, and obviously this now is probably the biggest controversy there's been since. And I wonder if for the next, I think they have two years left, three years left in the ORS, if they'll be more careful about their public remarks or if they'll keep uh, being vocal uh, about things they obviously care about. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, one thing I think that it's important to note also is that in the Tory leadership uh, debate that took place yesterday on Sky News between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, Liz Truss was actually asked a, a question relating to what we're talking about by a member of the audience. And uh, he essentially asked, uh, what do you think needs to be done to bring about a lasting peace between both parties? She talked about the support she's going to provide to Ukraine, and I think the audience member reiterated the question and said, yes, but how we bring about a lasting peace? And she said, it's very important to remember Hitler uh, and the steps that he took and in the early 20th century and how uh, we glossed over it. So you cited Chamberlain. That's the example that she was sort of drawing uh, from. And she talked about how you can't let that happen again. If you're not wary, intelligent, history repeats itself. And I don't think uh, it's an overstretch to apply that to this predicament per se, because Putin has proven himself to be a rather idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic character in the world stage. Uh, and Ukraine, you know, it's a country yearning to be part of the European project. So as an ally, you could say Ireland, I think it's only reasonable for Ireland to take a, a stance that supports Ukraine and especially symbolically being the nation that we are considering our history with colonialism. I think it's only right for us to stand against it when we see it.
Uh, and as for the question of the presidency, we'll have to wait and see uh, what comes out of the RS uh, over the next two years. It's going to be interesting and interesting to see the response and whether it truly does get constitutional, because some would argue that Michael D has been treading around the constitutional pool. Uh, and I think addressing or rather making comments that many people will politically disagree with, others wouldn't. So if he accidentally slips into it or goes into it for assume deliberately, it's going to be interesting to see the backlash and the reactions. So, yeah, I can't wait. It's definitely going to, I think, um, fill many uh, conversations in a constitutional law class. <laughs> mm -hmm, for sure. And there, there is cause for caution, too, actually, as well, with the whole situation, because even back with the housing comment, when Michael D said that, you know, we're experiencing a housing disaster and it's shameful or whatever. And obviously that was a true statement. Um, he's right. Housing is a disaster in the country. He didn't say anything wrong. Uh, but the problem was that it was the president speaking about policy uh, aside from the government, which isn't his role. And I remember saying to someone at the time that, OK, th this is a true statement. But my concern is what happens if there's a president who doesn't have very um, safe views in the future? Uh, and let's not forget that Peter Casey came very close. Well, not very close, but he, he, he came second in the last presidential uh, election here. And he was someone with very an like, uh, anti-traveller discriminatory views. Uh, against minority um, communities in Ireland. And my concern is that if President Higgins normalizes kind of pushing the boundaries of the constitution, does that open the way for someone who doesn't have very palatable views um, and can uh, use the platform to say dangerous and inflammatory things? Um, does that kind of pave the way uh, for that to happen in the next presidency or a future presidency? Uh, and that's kind of my issue with uh, Michael D's kind of um, disregard, I suppose, for the constraints of the office. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that, Eric, but that's just a, a flag that I wanted to wave before we kind of started to move on. Yeah, I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, worry. I, I do think, though, that we've seen in some presidents, like Mary Robinson, for example, a type of radicalism when it comes to public utterances. Also, when it comes to her actions, uh, she was, I think, ahead of her time and on many questions. Um, she's a feminist, you know, pro-environment when it comes to her approach. Um, she's, of course, the first uh, female president in Ireland. And in a lot of the things that she did, you know, I think it was identified as radical at her time. And then thereafter, we had uh, successive presidents, for example, Mary McAleese, who has taken, you know, strong, ardent uh, stances against, let's say, aspects of the Catholic Church, but who wasn't nearly as radical, some would say, as uh, Mary Robinson. And then Michael D. Higgins has been incredibly vocal on questions like housing and the like. Um, so I think with figures like Michael D., I think a president definitely precedent could be set for future figures. But I think ultimately it'll always boil down to one's political approach to these issues. So with uh, his comments about housing, you saw many of the opposition parties sharing it and talking about how great it was. And many ordinary citizens who agreed showing appreciation for the speech and seeing him as being a bastion for uh, the common man and woman. Um, then you saw more gov governmental parties who are actually grappling with the issue, talking about how they're working hard and working diligently to resolve the problem and how it's not a matter of, you know, applying butter on toast. It's actually a really difficult issue. Um, and I, I think there's that insistence within the government. And I've seen it time and again with a podcast that we discussed a while ago between Una... Malali, the journalist and the politician Neil Richmond, um, he spoke to Una about how if you're going to criticize government on housing, um, uh, supply some proposals. What do you think we can do better? Um, and I think with the president, there was a similar response by government parties towards the president. Um, so it really depends on your political outlook when it comes to these questions. Uh, I certainly don't think, I still think resignation is too extreme a call, not to tie art in, in it per se, but I don't think that was an unpopular uh, call in some people's uh, minds. Um, but then again, setting a precedent that is very, I think, outward uh, and visible might have a stronger push than some of the things that figures like Robinson has done in the past. So we definitely have to be wary of that and whether this should lead to a constitutional change to restrict the role of the Oros. Although I wouldn't necessarily support that and I think that it'd be taken badly in a lot of circles. <laughs> Yeah, look, it raises a lot of interesting questions. And I think the Irish presidency, it's something that people can kind of forget about it. Uh, and then the presidential elections come up and there's a big deal made of it. And the person settles into the role 
for seven years or 14 years. Um, and no one really digs into it too much. But I think it's something maybe we could dig into in a future episode um, about the presidency as an office, because I just think it's really interesting. And uh, obviously, the election isn't too far away, uh, a, a few years uh, to the next election. And it's bound to be uh, an interesting one, because uh, for the first time in 14 years, we won't have an incumbent uh, running and God only knows who is going to run because it is Ireland and it is a presidential election. And there's no doubt be loads of drama uh, for us to talk about. But anyway, we'll leave aside poor Al Sabina and Michael D and give them a break uh, for a bit because they've gotten an earful over the last uh, few days. And we'll move to another area, Eric. And Eric, you've been doing lots of writing lately. It's great. Uh, and keep it up. Uh, I know I'm biased, but I'm a big fan. Um, you've put out a good few uh essays, pieces on uh, Medium over the past few weeks. Um, and one that kind of caught my eye and is one that is kind of centred around discussions we've had since we started this podcast. And obviously, personally, um, we kind of always talk about this kind of area. And it's about the kind of idea of the culture wars. And obviously, we spoke a lot about culture wars, whether it be here on or on. We did an episode of for your YouTube channel with Sean Carey uh, about Joe Rogan. It, it's something we constantly talk about, the idea of culture wars internationally. But your essay here kind of focuses on the culture war that might be at play here in Ireland, in Irish politics. So do you want to maybe explain what you kind of said in that essay? Because I think it's great. Thank you so much for the kind words, uh, Luca. I really appreciate it. Um, and yes, the culture war, I, I think it's been on the tongue of anyone concerned, many people concerned with uh, political affairs in uh, this part of the world over the past year. Uh, it's just been everywhere. It's been having a really heavy uh, in, in influence. I think it pervades the political arena. Uh, and in the case of the essay I wrote, I wrote about a sort of Irish twist to the culture war, so an Irish-specific culture war. And this is something that you and I, again, have talked a lot about in recent times. And unlike the culture war that is most popular, w which is very ideological and left-right, this culture war, I think, is being represented by two parties. Sinn Féin and Fine Gael. This is what I essentially wanted to, I, I, I broached in my, in my piece. This was the uh, kind of theme that my piece was pr predicated on. And it was about the different cultures that both parties represent. So I think we've seen the culture war play out mainly in the clashes in the doll. But unlike traditional government opposition clashes, I think there's a real thematic element to it. Where Sinn Féin, you know, they brand themselves as a sort of left, left populist, uh, you know, party for the layman, for the ordinary person. In my piece, I talked about them embracing a sort of Robin Hood style uh, populism, where they see themselves, the people to sort of topple those at the top of the hierarchy, oppressing society. And that, of course, in their political vision is FFG, the FFG syndicate, Fine Gael and Fine Fall, and bring about a sort of day in which everybody lives in a prosperous Ireland and where our healthcare services are working effectively, housing is working right, and everybody is happy and jolly um and then Fine Gael brand themselves as sort of the reasonable rational pragmatic center-right party that um is against the juju fanciful economics of uh Sinn Féin but wants to actually manage the country right manage the books and bring about a better day through that methodology so there's a sort of ideological clash thematic clash underpinning the back and forths that we see in the doll and because of the contrast how stark it is the, the viciousness in the back and forth between both parties is so extreme that I think it's come to define the political approaches of both parties in modern times. So I imagine conversations are occurring internally on both sides about how we can get the other side. And I think we saw this with the um, election in Dublin Bay South, where there was a, 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 something put out on the Fine Gael end of things, basically telling voters to come out to vote for Fine Gael because Sinn Féin voters were going out to vote for Sinn Féin. And people talked about there being an anti-working class undertone to that advert, to that sort of promotional post because of the fact that it was predominantly working class people going out to vote, apparently, or at least in that area. It was assumed that working class people were there, which sort of lives up to that dichotomous uh, Fine Gael pragmatism versus Sinn Féin, Robin Hood uh, image. So I think this culture war has been a very interesting one. It ha it's like been absent of a lot of the traditional elements of the wider culture war in that it's not as ideologically charged per se, but it's to do with narrative. Um, you could write a, a sort of a short novel about it with the way that both parties frame the approach the, that they're taking and the clash that's occurring. Uh, and I think the, 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 the differences run so deep 
that they trickle into the youth parties too. This is something that I talked about in my piece. So you have YFG being a party that very much takes on the form of the, the, the father or the mother party, but also the broad church of different people from the center to the right. Whereas in Sinn Féin, there's a sort of really boisterous, radical uh, leftist element to it, posts supporting Che Guevara, and particular posts also about the IRA, uh, nationalists, uh, over the past century too, uh, which I think talk, it alludes to a future chapter in the culture war where the youth wings might take it up because of the thematic and the symbolic clashes between, between both sides. Uh, and then, of course, social media has been the battleground where we've been seeing the slings and arrows being shots between, shot between both parties too. So this is essentially what my piece touched on. And again, it's something that we've discussed about, discussed a lot uh, in recent times. So I'd love to th hear what you think of the thesis of the piece or whether it's something that you've recognized too, a sort of cultural clash between both parties that runs so deep that it distinguishes it from the traditional government versus opposition clash that we see in bicameral parliaments across the world. Yeah, look, it's a great piece. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And just for people who might want to read it, because I know, Eric, you're so humble, you probably won't tell people where they can find it. Um, the best way, I think, to find it is to go to Eric's Instagram, and he has a link tree there, and you can find all his great articles on his medium there. So so do give it a read, uh, and we'll put it in the bio of this um, episode. Uh, but but I do think it's a, it's a great point. And I, I do somewhat agree, uh, or more so like 95 percent agree with your, with your thesis I, I i think you're right that i'm not sure i'd use the word culture wars at this point because i'm not sure it's kind of invaded society and the kind of everyday political discourse like this sort of culture war has in in the uk for example or in america uh, i don't think there are massive cohorts of people who are like massive 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 ardent supporters of Fine Gael and Sinn Féin online back and forth arguing against each other um, I mean, you'll find the representatives themselves doing that, but I think, um, and you'll find the people in the youth wings do that, but I'm not sure it's kind of uh, spread out to the wider public yet. Um, but that could certainly come. And, you know, an election is on the horizon. Uh, we'll definitely have local elections and European elections in 2024 and a general election after that. And I think this, the type of stuff you've pointed out, I think we're bound to see in that election. And we saw a lot of it in uh, the 20, uh, 2020 election, I suppose, Mary Lou kind of, kicked off that idea of the kind of populist idea, I suppose. And it is kind of trying to pit the public against Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, Tweedledee, Tweedledum um, narrative of, of her out to get them. And I suppose in that moment, I don't think Fine Gael really started to, to target Sinn Féin because I think that was a point in the election still when people didn't recognise Sinn Féin as a massive threat. And a lot of the thrust of, I think, Fine Gael's um, arguments at the time was actually Fianna Fáil. I remember... Uh, I remember Leo Varadkar said that putting Michal Martin in charge of the government would be like putting uh, John Delaney in charge of the FAI again or something like that. So, uh, yeah, which, I mean, looking back now is interesting. But anyway, we, we move on. Um, but now, I think come the next election, I think the target for Nigel will certainly be uh, Sinn Féin. And it's going to be a very interesting election. And yeah, look at their look at their TikToks. It's there already. It's kind of uh, what borders on perhaps an obsession with each other. Um, and maybe that's their desire, the desire of both parties to get it to a point where it's a two-party race. Um, it's a choice between Fine Gael or Sinn Féin. Uh, is kind of, I think, what they might be going for. Uh, and that that benefits them electorally both because they, they both have slightly different electorates. Uh, and yeah, you don't see them talk much about their, their other counterpart, counterparts. Sinn Féin don't speak much about, you know, Labour, for example. And Labour speak a good bit about them and criticise them. Um, Sinn Féin don't speak as nearly as much about Fianna Fáil as they do Fine Gael. Um, and similarly, Fine Gael's criticism is kind of dead centre on Sinn Féin all the time. So I think your your thesis is, is is definitely right. And I think you in your final paragraph, you kind of hope that it doesn't descend into the kind of chaos that is culture wars and kind of post-truth populism in the UK and the US, where things get so crazy that conspiracy theories form about each other um, and people kind of get brainwashed and you have the likes of QAnon is essentially um, what can happen when this th stuff gets to its extreme. Uh, but I do wonder, let's say you're a strategist for the parties, how would you, this is obviously, it's a tough question, right? Uh, and you can answer for Fine Gael or Sinn Féin or both. 
how would you like to see them target each other? Because obviously they're parties that are diametrically opposed, more or less. Um, how would you like to see the ideal discourse in politics? And I, I, I'm definitely putting you on the spot here, uh, but I'd be interested to know what you think. Okay, so I'm going to reiterate your question. Uh, so if I was a strategist for either party, how would I deliberately go out of, go proceed to target the other party to favor the party I represent electorally? All right, I might reword it because that's a bit tough, right? I'd say <laughs> so as in an ideal world, so as a, as a citizen of Ireland, as a member of a, d a democracy, how would what, what's your preferred way of communication for a, par a party of opposites, let's say? So of mm -hmm. a government party and an opposition party, how would you like to see them battle? Because I think, and we both agree here, that the discourse isn't ideal um, and it's not right, it's not going in the right direction. How can discourse be changed to be more kind of pragmatic and honest and sincere? That's a tough okay. question. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to, I know we talked about idealism earlier with Sabina's letter, but please pivot away from me. Uh, <laughs> something I've been thinking really seriously about uh, with regards to politics uh, and discourse is a space being made for science and politics. Now, hear me out. <laughs> uh, one thing that I really appreciate about just the scientific enterprise and scientists in general, no matter what form or color or shade they, they come in, is the fact that there's, an, there's a sort of intellectual modesty in science that you just don't see in politics. Scientists who would be really well informed, let's say in evolutionary biology or in medicine or in any area of psychology, uh, there's a sort of yearning to learn more and to be corrected. And you have to be modest in order to take in more information as you go forward. Uh, there's a sort of, there's a quote from Socrates that says, all I know is that I know nothing. And I think that's a radically scientific statement because you have to have that attitude to be able to intake more information and engage in discourse in a way that sees you wanting to learn. Whereas the opposite is true in politics, where, there, where there's an approach of stridently standing up as if you know it all to appear in a particular way, to take a macho, Machiavellianism, Machiavellian sort of uh, aesthetic uh, to attract people. There's also sophistry in politics as well. And I think it's bad in the culture wars because Everybody in the culture words thinks they're right, um, when a lot of people aren't correct. And I think if there was more of a, an appreciation for science and scientific fact that's out there, more people would be willing to see what's right, see what's truthful, and then push towards it. So on an issue like housing, for example, there are some things that the government say, and I think it's a very neoclassical economic approach about supply and demand, like rent, rent freezes. The economical argument when it comes to rent freezes is that if you freeze rent, it makes landlords not want to invest within a particular area because they can't make anything from it. They take their money and then they invest elsewhere. This is a scientific in, the, in that it's economic approach to economics. And politicians would argue against it. Why? Because of populism and because it's favorable to argue against it. Uh, and then if they're really effective communicators, they can act as if they're the scientific ones and the people who are advocating for a particular approach Aren't. Now, there are loopholes to that economic arguments, there are exceptional cases, but generally speaking, if our politicians were married to science, to studies that have been done that revealed particular information about certain issues in society, I think we then have a North Star that could guide us in a better direction when it comes to policy making. And I think that's good for everybody, good for the citizens because they're being served in an evidence-based way, but also good for the politicians because they're doing the serving in an effective way. But politics is a game of Populism, it's a game of Machiavellianism, it's a game of employment at the same time. So I think this is all in the back of the mind uh, of the politician. And I think when that's taken to its extreme, as it is with the culture war, it makes for a toxic politics. That's why we see in America so many crazy governors coming out with the most radical of statements uh, because they know it's appealing to people and it's going to keep them in positions of power. We saw the era of Trump. That's essentially what that was. With Boris Johnson, we saw sort of Plato like politician, Plato on the fact that he was formless. You couldn't really place him on the political spectrum. He was so formless. He's a conservative, yes, right populist, yes. But if he wants to be, what about the left wing radical redistributive policies that they call the sort of red meat policies to get uh, uh, kind of uh, clicks and uh, looks from the populists that were favorable to him and his party? Uh, and that's a dangerous politics, and I don't think it's good for anyone. Rory Stewart, uh, a politician you and I both favor from the Conservative Party. Why I really like his brand of conservative politics 
in contrast to Johnson's, is that there's integrity to it in that he appreciates what's right and what's truthful. It's what I'd call a scientific political approach. Um, and I think that's ultimately what I think can combat uh, a lot of the culture war parliamentary politics and even the discourse, generally speaking, the sort of what is a woman stuff, uh, for example, the fact that that's creeping into politics is scary because it takes the front of science. It takes the veneer of science. But if you truly dig into, let's say, different areas of science, you see the fact that there's a gender spectrum. You see the fact that there, you know, there's so many different factors to consider whilst also thinking about our values and philosophical issues too. too. So I'd argue ultimately for a greater appreciation for science um, and a, a no to populism. <laughs> Well, I think that's an absolutely brilliant answer to a, a very difficult question that I just came up with on the spot and completely cornered you with. Uh, but I 100% agree. And I hope that um, both Mary Lee MacDonald and Leo Vereiker and their respective party colleagues will hopefully take on some of that advice. Because I think, the, as you mentioned there with America and similarly with the UK, this kind of culture war, this kind of political dialogue uh, can lead to very bad um, political discourse. Uh, and we see that actually to, to go back to Liz and Rishi, uh, which is a obviously current story that we covered in the last episode. Um, as you said, one of the, the biggest questions in this debate is their stance on, on gender and, and sexuality and, you know, what is a woman? Uh, and trying to, you know, start this culture war about um, trans rights, um, which is just crazy and I'm not sure how we even got to the point where this is a massive political discussion because I'm not sure many people, normal people actually care about it and I think most people if I was to guess this is completely no analytical evidence to back it up I'm sure most people will be, will be of the opinion to let people live their lives and do what they want to do but it's become a massive political discussion in the UK and obviously in the US it's probably worse than, it's definitely worse than the, than the UK because as you said there are governors who have literally come to office based on this kind of culture war, uh, anti-identity politics, anti-woke um, platform. Uh, C-SPAN, or not C-SPAN, uh, CPAC is happening in America at the minute. It's like a conservative action group. That they get together uh, and the tagline of the event is awake, not woke, because apparently they're awake um, and everyone else is too woke. Uh, which is crazy. And if you look at the dialogue that's happening there, I mean, Viktor Orban, Prime Minister of, of Hungary, spoke there today. Viktor Orban, someone who just a couple of weeks ago spoke about not wanting um, mixed race couples to more or less exist in his country. Uh, and people of his own party resigned because of his Nazi-like statements. Uh, and here's this man speaking to crowds of fawning uh, culture war fans in America to kind of push forward the, the stuff that you see, like in Florida with Ron DeSantis and the Don't Say Gay Bill is just another example of, um, you know, LGBT same-sex teams not being allowed in the classroom. Um, I think the dialogue, potentially, as you point out in your essay, that starts with a kind of bending of the facts, priority, priority on winning blows against the party, however, your opposing party, party however it may come about, I think it does start with this dialogue that we're starting to see in Ireland. And I think you were really right to kind of uh, wave the flag again on this before it gets down the, the ugly path. Because I think, look at the stuff that's happening in the, in the UK and the US, it's, it's not right and we don't want to see it here. And thankfully, we've seen very little of it here so far. Yeah, and arguably, uh, Luke, we saw glimpses and we've seen glimpses of that style of culture war politics uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know there was a Sinn Féin representative who likened uh, the vaccine passes to uh, segregation. And I think she invoked the name of Rosa Parks when she was saying this. And that would have appealed to a significant swath of the Irish populace, understandably, people who were scared and who didn't understand what was going on and who might not have understood the rationale behind the policy. And I think that's the sort of kind of laziness in politics. And it's a lack of a consideration for why particular policies are passed. Uh, and then that lazy approach inspiring one that appeals to lots of people. It's pop, there's a populist element to it too, and uh, it's very worrying. Uh, and it's something that I hope we, we bypass in Ireland. And we talk about the don't say gay bill, there was lots on critical race theory as well, which baffled me. Governors engaging in dialogue about passing legislation to ban a particular theory from being taught to school in schools. Now, there's so many different elements of that conversation, but just the idea of that existing within America, a country that politically makes such a big deal 
rightfully so, of the First Amendment. Um, you know, taking these radical approaches, uh, it's really, really scary. And I hope that Ireland does bypass it because we can't afford to go down that line. Uh, and I think a more common sense approach to politics should be what we support here. Um, because who knows? Uh, I think it's really, really dangerous. There's a capacity it has, I think, to poison the young people, the minds of young people involved in politics too. Uh, at CPAC last year, I believe they had Kyle Rittenhouse um, at the event. And he, of course, was being charged with the murder murder of, I think, three people at a, a, a riot that was taking place in his local area. He was a young person, I think 18 years old, and he shot them to death. And he was brought to CPAC and he, he, was, he met a roaring crowd and uh, big culture war figures like Stephen Crowder, um, Charlie Kirk spoke, his, he sang his praises. Um, and I think that's really dangerous to do to a young person and to young people witnessing that. So yes, we have to rail against it and offer a different approach to politics, one that's closer, in closer proximity to truth, however you define it, despite your political bias, uh, and one that serves the Irish people. Um, yeah, the culture war, it's growing more and more. It's like the last time we talked about it on the podcast a couple of months ago, it just wasn't here at all. It just didn't pervade mainstream politics. Now it seems like the poisonous apple that everyone's biting. Um, yeah, so you have to keep out, keep railing against it, I guess, and be wary <laughs> about its implications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's, um, we should be wary. And I think we did see it kind of rear its head during COVID. There, there was kind of starts of it. Um, but I think there, there could be an attempt by the media to try and stoke some of it too. Because I know that um, when, two weeks ago, I think at this point, when Norma Foley announced reforms to the RSE curriculum for second level, so relationship, sexuality, education. Um, one, so it's a big curriculum document about a new framework for teaching teenagers about uh, relationships and sex. And one bullet point in the curriculum document, um, again, paraphrasing, but more or less students to think about um, pornography and how that portrays sexual relationships, which is obviously very important. It's a very important discussion to have with teenagers in the context of education. Um, but the headline on the Irish Independent the day after was uh, something like plans to, to, no, teenagers to study porn under new RSC curriculum or something like that, which is like, I think uh, that headline was designed purely uh, to generate hysteria, uh, to get parents annoyed and say they don't want their kids to learn about that. Uh, and for this kind of back and forth to start between people on both sides of their argument, when really the truth is couldn't be any closer away from that headline. Um, so I think that was an attempt, to be honest. Uh, thankfully, I don't think it did. I mean, it, there was probably a few people called into live line. Uh, on RT1, um, but uh, I don't think it generated much hysteria. But I think there, we need to be conscious of attempts by the media to, to generate that hysteria too. Absolutely. I actually was called into um, the local radio show, the Joe Finnegan Show. Shout out Mr. Finnegan. He's a legend out in Longford <laughs> and to discuss this. Uh, and it's something that I, I tried to, I essentially said everything you just said, Luke, um, how you know it, it has nothing to do with a lot of the radical statements being made as part of the moral panic that people are trying to generate about around issues like this. And I know recently there was the issues with RTE. Uh, I know Dublin Pride disassociated with RTE because of a, a radio show uh, that I believe Joe Duffy um, hosted uh, where the issue of trans rights were discussed. And I think this opens the door to the question of how do we broach a lot of these difficult questions whilst ensuring we don't tip into the hellfire of the culture war. And what do we need to allow? What do we need to disallow? Do we need to be ultra restrictive with the risk that that entails? Or do we need to be more liberal with our approach with the risk that that might come with? Um, I think we really need to think about that. I think that's a conversation we need to have because I think the culture war speaks to the worst of our human in in inclinations. And there are some questions in society that are simply unavoidable. So the question of what is a woman, despite the fact that I don't want my political candidates at election time being asked that because I'm finding it hard to buy Cocoa Pops to discuss a living crisis, uh, these questions still are ones that they pervade the arena of public discourse. And instead of running away from them or hugging them in, aggress in an aggressive way and talking about them in an unhealthy manner, we have to think about ways in which we can foster a space where they can be discussed 
uh, carefully, respectfully, but also forthrightly uh, in a manner that brings about a resolution that's good for all parties. And that, again, as we talked about previously, that is a scientifically, that maintains scientific integrity as much as possible. I think that is essentially uh, the golden rod that I think can allow us to, to fight the, 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 the impulse, the culture war impulse that probably exists in all of us. Well, I think there's no better note to end the podcast on than that one, because I think that's partly the aim of why we started this podcast, Eric. It's to, to have these discussions in a way that isn't inflammatory, um, that isn't kind of um, politically motivated in any way, um, in a way that's accessible to, to everyone. Uh, we simply want to have the conversation and not contribute to the negativity um, and performativity, I think, that can be found in uh, political discourse um, everywhere, uh, including here. Um, but yeah, it's been a great uh, podcast episode. We covered a lot of areas um, from the Oris to political discourse. Um, why not? Uh, that is the political incorrectors at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, look, it's great to be back and we will have more content to you very soon. Uh, if you have any ideas for stuff you'd like us to talk about or guests you'd like us to have on the podcast, uh, do let us know. Um, message us on Instagram um, or Twitter or Facebook. Uh, we'll see it and we'll reply uh, but between now and our next episode do rate and review this podcast if it helps uh, and share it with a friend and we will see you very soon thanks so much for tuning in um, Sloan see you everyone